to see you all here today. My name is Maureen Hartman. I'm the Deputy Director for Public Services for the St. Paul Public Library. And I have the great joy and privilege of introducing today's event and um, the speakers to follow me. So um, I'd like to start with a, a land acknowledgement. Every community owes its existence and vitality energy to make it a history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are standing on the lands of the Dakota people. We acknowledge the Ojibwe and the Ho-Chunk people who also call this place home. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the treaties made by tribal nations that entitle non-native people to live and work on traditional native lands. Consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration and settlement that brings us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you. Before we get started, I want to also acknowledge um, the sponsors for this program. So Read Brave St. Paul is brought to you by the St. Paul Public Library and the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. This program in particular is funded with money from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with special support from the St. Paul Saints and Bernadette and Jeffrey Janch. And I also want to make sure we thank Stephanie Hankerson, the Como Seed Library, and the Minnesota State Horticultural Society for donating seeds. Um, so I want to just uh, let you all know, in case Read Brave is new to you, that Read Brave is, uh, of all the many things we do at the library, we are all so very proud of them. And Read Brave is one of those amazing things. It is a citywide intergenerational reading initiative. It centers the powers of books to ignite empathy and help us think of big ideas to build a better St. Paul. So Read Brave connects readers of all ages to one another through books for multiple audiences, their authors, some of whom are here today, programs, and call to action. If you see this uh, beautiful Saint uh, Read Brave sign up here, there were five books this year, and um, our main title is was The Magic Fish. We had an excellent event last week with Trung Lee Nguyen, and today we're so excited to talk about what we hunger for which is the title that we're going to be talking about today. So this evening's conversation brings together a dynamic group of esteemed authors from our nonfiction title, What We Hunger For, Refugee and Immigrant Stories About Food and Family. Tonight's author panel is curated by local artist and writer an awesome individual, Anne Hua T. Nguyen, who, in addition to having an essay in What We Hunger For, is also the co-creator of this year's Recipes for Care interactive community art installation project that we brought into this room specifically for this event. So you can see it there after the program. But this, uh, this um, installation, Recipes for Care, is a project that invites community members to share recipes that ignite, shape, and support a community of care in their lives. And so we're so happy to host it here at the Rondo Library and also at our Sunray Library over on the east side. So um, I want to turn over um, this podium to my colleague in the library who's been critical to this uh, panel and also to Recipes for Care, who's going to tell you a little bit more about this year's theme, um, Savannah Panswiri. I'm going to invite her up. And um, we'll go from there. Yeah. Hello, my name is Savannah Ponsweary. I'm a library associate at St. Paul Public Library here at Rondo. Welcome to Rondo if you haven't been here. Um, see a few housekeeping rules before we get, uh, get started to remember, please take a moment to turn off your phones and other devices or turn them to silent. 
Help yourselves to bottled waters. We have some in back. Um, restroom keys are toward the back of the room. There are note cards at each one of your seats with um, pencil. If you have any questions, you can submit it and we will collect it towards the end for a question and answer. Um, like Maureen said, this year's Read Brave theme around community care asks us to read, think, and talk brave about how we care for each other and our uh, connected collective well-being. Through the community art installation Recipes for Care, curated for, by Anhua, we ask, what does community care look like to you? From that, we collected recipes that ignites, shape, and supports community, as it has been said. Um, tonight, we're going to hear from our amazing um, author panel. But before that, I want to actually share um, some of my impressions. When I first um, saw the book, I thought, I'm going to get through this in one sitting. This was not true at all. Um, <laughs> I had to read the collection of stories in parts. Some brought laughter, others tears and reflection. I really had to savor each one and digest them individually as a collective. This is the magic of food and ingredients. It teaches us patience while it stews. It holds hope and home and memory. It is medicine. This is why we're talking about community care and sharing recipes to nourish ourselves and each other while carrying out traditions, because who we are comes from our stories and our food. With this, I give you the What We Hunger For, Food as Connection and Care author panel. My name is Kristen Lilvis. I'm the Mueller Liley Endowed Chair in English at St. Catherine University. And St. Kate's is proud to co sponsor this event because the Read Brave series and this particular text, What We Hunger For, really speak to our university's social justice mission and our commitment to prioritizing diverse experiences and voices. And I'm especially excited to introduce my friend and colleague at St. Kate's, Anwa Nguyen, who dedicates herself to this social justice mission. Um, Anhua is the Administrative Assistant for Arts and Humanities Division and also a lecturer in our English department and our core programs. She brings her strengths as an artist, writer, and activist to all that she does, including as an artist in residence for part of this Read Brave program. I'm thrilled that you're all going to have the ability to get to know her a little bit today and be just as inspired by her as I am each moment we get to spend together. So I want to introduce to you Anwa Nguyen. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. I'm so um, honored um, and proud to be a St. Paul uh, neighbor. Uh, I grew up in St. Paul. And Rondo is my community library. And I absolutely um, adore this space and the people who work here. Um, and I'm just so grateful to have this opportunity to bring these, um, I was going to say kick ass, is that OK? Kick ass <laughs> um, writers um, into my community and my neighborhood. Um, and um, I just want to let you know that the, the bios for these wonderful women are in um, your program. So I'm not going to take the time to read them because they're so esteemed. It would take all night to um, talk to you about the wonderful things that they do. So I'm going to just invite each member to introduce themselves. Um, so why don't you go ahead first. Uh, sure. Um, hi, I'm Zalesh Niaz. I'm a poet mainly. I also write children's books. Um, and essays, <laughs> one is in what we hunger for. I am currently an MFA candidate at the University of Houston and a co-founder of Afghan Refugee Aid, a nonprofit supporting Afghans in Minnesota Ooh. and in Afghanistan with my sister, <laughs> Farah Yay! Yay! Hi everyone, my name is May Liang, first name is May. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a writer, performer, educator and I should probably use this as an opportunity to plug I'm a member of a group called Funny Asian Woman Collective and we have a comedy show happening at the Broadway on April 16th so if you need comedy in your life uh, please come out. Yay. My, my name is Valerie Deus. Um, I, yeah, I teach at MCTC. I'm a poet. I I'm also a programmer for the Progress Down Film Festival. I, I, I do a lot of different things. Um, I also I really write essays. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Um, and I'm excited to be here. Happy to meet everyone and to, to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Applaud, everyone. Um, I'm Sonia Shen. I'm a poet and I write in all different genres, um, like picture books and other essay anthologies. And I'm really interested in uh, being part of bringing conversations uh, to community spaces around culture, race, racism, uh, liberation, and uh, care. Yeah, thank you. So Son Young is also the editor of this amazing anthology, and also the anthology um, A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota, among other poetry books as well. So I'm just so grateful that we have the editor in the room, and this is so very exciting. Um, so I'm gonna just kick us off with the first question because I wanna um, maybe ground the conversation in the theme for Read Brave this year. And so the first question for all of you, and feel free to, um, we don't have to go down the line, you can, we can just organically have a conversation. Um, but how would you describe the ways that food is important to you, especially as an expression of comfort and care? Go first since <laughs> <laughs> this is all my fault. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, I would say that it's been such it's been such food's been such an interesting journey. I talk about it a little bit in the introduction, but I was adopted from South Korea and grew up in um, the Chicago area with a uh, German, Polish, Irish family um, who'd been in Chicago for several generations. And so I grew up with their traditions and also my parents made sure that I was growing up with some Korean traditions and Korean food as well. So as I've gotten older, um, it's been really uh, an important part of my journey as a Korean American to go back to South Korea, learn more about food and also um, I've just been so surprised, delighted, and confounded by the increasing popularity of Korean food in the United States, as well as just, just Korean culture. So it also just reminds me that um, there's always surprises, and we just can't predict you know, what kinds of foods are going to come into uh, our communities. So Sunyang would be very humble because whenever I come to her home, she's very caring to me with food. <laughs> and so um, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about our friendship is that we, um, we care for each other through, through food. Yes. Yeah. I can go. Yes. Right, can I, no, go for it, yeah. Um, food for me is... Um, uh, it means uh, everything. It's it's one of the. I'm like I grew up. Uh, my parents are Haitian. Um, grew up in a Haitian traditional Haitian household. I grew up in New York, and it's one of the ways that if I'm if if my parents have been upset with me during the day about something, one of the ways that they make up the being upset is sort of like to ask me. It's like, so are you hungry? Do you, have you have you eaten yet? And that's part of the sort of entry way of sort of like, no, I haven't eaten. And then you can sort of like, <laughs> then you made up in some sort of way. Um, so food, and <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's like when we think about, when I talk to my family members about food, um, when we think about either going to an event or being at an event, some sort of Haitian event, we sort of like try to think about like, well, what, who's going to be cooking? What's going to be the food? What's going to be, it sort of like becomes the, 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 the thing that keeps us, not necessarily keeps us going, but makes it sort of, it becomes very important in what is happening food wise for us to whether or not we will attend or whether or not we will not attend. Um, so that tradition is, is um, culturally very, very tight. And for me, it always, I mean, when I was moving here, that was the first thing I sort of thought of. I was like, well, where will I eat? What can I make at home? What can I, can I figure this out? Where can I find, and uh, even in the essay, it's like, where can I find plantains? Will I be able to find this? Because it's, it's so important. <laughs> it's so important to my stomach. It's like, it, without it, it just feels very disjointed. Yeah, so. 
Uh, food is such a stabilizer. Um, I'm Afghan. Like my, I grew up in rural Wisconsin. Uh, my parents are from Kabul, Afghanistan, and they came uh, in the 80s uh, with the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan and uh, the Soviet. Uh, and like, uh, I think that as refugees, food has acted as a stabilizer. When you come here, you have your certain cultural practices that you bring, and it's so reassuring when you go to a restaurant that serves sort of food that you're used to, um, especially when most of the things around you are so un unfamiliar. And I feel like that applies even if you're just moving to a new place within the country. Like I've moved so much in my lifetime now, and every time I move, I have that same experience of like, oh no, I don't know anyone here. I have no friends here. I have no, nothing here that, I, that is familiar to me. But something that is always familiar to me is that I can cook Afghan food. Mm. And every time that smell of cumin and that mm. steamed rice always makes me feel comforted. So it's like, I feel like that's something that everybody probably has, those kinds of stabilizing signifiers that make you feel at home in even the most un- uh, familiar spaces, and, and I think that food is like my comfort and my self care. Yeah, it's great. I suppose I should answer as well. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I'm Hmong American. Uh, I was born in a refugee camp, and I'm sure all this stuff is useful up to now. And, and, I, and I say that because I think food is comfort, but it's also about identity. It, it reminds me of of Hmong culture. I think about. You know, like one of my best friends, uh, she, she was supposed to be here, but she's sick. Um, but she's like, Hmong people share love of pork. I'm like, yes, we do. Because, you know, I, my joke is always, in Laos, we didn't, have, we didn't have the privilege of eating meat all the time because people were poor. They lived in the mountains, right? Um, so I think about, you know, um, how food has, e the types of food that Hmong people eat um, ex explains our relationship to the spaces that we're in. I think about, um, you know, the kinds of foods that we have adapted into our own and then what is really authentically Hmong, because so much of our food is, you know, um, Lao, Thai, American, other stuff, now Korean, <laughs> other stuff. But I think about, you know, what is essentially Hmong food? And I've come to the conclusion it probably is pepper and boiled meats. And it seems really simple, but it's, um, it's comfort food. I mean, it's comfort. But I also think about food in terms of my, you know, growing up here in the 80s and 90s and how a lot of us were taught to be ashamed about who we were, and so we, you would never see Hmong food in a public space. And now I look at kids who go to charter schools and they eat pho and Hmong sausage and sticky rice for lunch. Wow. Um, <laughs> and they, they're, they're proud, they, they eat stinky papaya salad in public spaces unapologetically, and our food is sort of, has, it's, anyway, it's been interesting to track its evolution. Um, so one of the things that, um, makes me think of about um, the, your relation with food is we think about the connection to food, but we also don't really think about the absence of the food. Um, and one of the stories I'll tell is that I was at a, a residency, a writing residency for two months in Washington State in, on an island, and there was one Chinese restaurant on the island. It was at the opposite end of the island, and I had no car. Oh, excuse me. And um, I was really dying because I, did, I didn't realize how dependent I was on not only Vietnamese food, but Asian food. Um, and even though I had brought my own rice cooker to um, the residency, it was still like there were so many flavors and so many um, things that I, I, I honestly had a breakdown because I was like, I don't know who I am in this space because I don't have things that comfort me. And especially when you're a writer, and you're trying to write about difficult things, um, you know, food is one of the ways that you can feel in touch with your body, or you feel whole, or you feel um, safe, right? I mean, food can be a lot of things to different people, but um, but for me, in that moment, that was what uh, Vietnamese food was to me. And so one of the things I think is really important in this collection is that we talk about what it means to us, but we also are trying to express the displacement as refugees and immigrants, right? And what happens when we are absent of that, of that food? Um, and so, Valerie, you talk about that a lot in your essay about coming to Minnesota and not being able to find um, the foods that resonate with you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how um, 
that help you understand even more your relationship to food? Yes. Um, great question. Yeah. It, the, the sort of realization of that, it, it's interesting because it's like when you are in a place where it's in abundance. And so growing up in New York, there, there's tons of Haitian people, there's Haitian restaurants, there's your parents, there's your aunties, there's all kinds of people who can supply you with whatever it is that you want at any moment. Um, and I, I really did not think about <laughs> when I moved, I just, it just didn't really fully occur to me that I'm like, well, I will not have this kind of access when I get here. And so walking around and just trying to think of like, okay, what cultures are close enough that I'd be able to get something that's similar and then walking into places and not being able to have that. And just the, dis just the, not only the disappointment, but just like the, the pain, it just, it just hurt. It was just like, I can't believe I did this to myself. <laughs> it was just so, and it was, and my parents were just sort of like, well, you wanted to move. And I'm like, I, I, God, you didn't I didn't understand that. I didn't really get it in my mind. It's like, even now I still have this, like my mother would make this specific meal for like Good Friday. And every time that time comes, I'm always like, oh, what I would really like right now is like a red snapper made in sauce with white rice and some white bean sauce. I know what the meal is. I still cannot make it the way my mom does and or did. And it makes me feel crazy. Like it's just this weird kind of like, I don't know, food clock or something. Like in my body, it's like the time is coming and I'm like, <laughs> that time's gonna come in that day, I'm gonna stay inside and just be sad. And I remember trying to go to a restaurant and eating something similar and it just, uh, just crushing. <laughs> it just, it just hurts. Um, but it's, it's, it's this sort of, it's a, it feels like a loss. It feels like, it feels like a death in a way. Um, and you try to recreate it. I'm still working on that recipe. It'll, I'll figure it out at some point. Um, but it, it really is, you don't realize it's like, you don't know what you have until it's gone. Right. It's like, you don't really realize how integral it is to your identity and the way that you feel and the way that you do feel comforted and, and the way that you you just feel whole. It's, yeah, it's, it's very important. So I grew up in rural Wisconsin and there was nothing in terms of access to anything. And we used to drive to Minneapolis, which was over an hour away, to go grocery shopping in this really remote little market run by a Palestinian man. So it was like Arab mm -hmm. stuff. So it was parallel to what we did, but it wasn't necessarily exactly it. So I totally feel you about how hard it was to get things. Like, you, to go to an Afghan market, you had to go to either the east or the west coast, which is like for a family, we have seven people. So to fly your family out mm. to east or west coast was a lot of money. And like this conversation of being disconnected from your foods and being able to recreate the foods that remind you of home has me thinking about the Afghans who are coming to Minneapolis right now. Like there's such a big housing crisis for affordable housing. So where are these people going? They're going to the most remote regions where they can afford to live and you can have a two bedroom, three bedroom apartment for an afford affordable cost for somebody who's coming with what? You know, credentials that don't necessarily transfer over. They're starting over completely in a new country. And so it's just like, making me think like, oh my God, this is still a problem today. Today we have Afghans coming to Rochester, uh, to Duluth and all these places where people do not have access to these ingredients. So I just really appreciate that you brought that up because it's like, you know, you think that you went through it and times are changing, but in, so, in reality, uh, so much of our experience is so circular. So yeah, I totally feel it. You know, um, this brings me, uh, to think about, um, so one of the things that always breaks my heart is when I hear about the Hmong experience and how um, the Hmong don't have a home or a land yeah. anymore. And so I think about, um, because, you know, it's, I, I'm always so amazed that when Hmong food or when my Hmong friends eat food that are very Vietnamese, like yeah. that I think are mm -hmm. Vietnamese, um, and then we realize, you know, we share a border, there are Hmong people in Vietnam. Um, do you think that food is one of the ways that you can, you, it's like a borderless border you know like that you kind of can be together as a community or yeah for sure I mean I, I, I think one of the interesting things about the Hmong community and one of the reasons why we're stateless but still have a really strong sense of like identity is because we're really good at adapting and also holding on to ourselves like you know I, we keep joking about Korean culture or like so many Hmong people love you know like K-pop culture so folks are like 
did you guys sell out? Did you throw away your culture? I mean, no, we didn't, you know, because we are still staunchly Hmong. You know, we love Bollywood, but we're still staunchly Hmong. <laughs> we love American food, we're still staunchly Hmong because we, I think we can hold all of these identities at the same time. And so I think about, um, you know, uh, the kinds of foods that we have. Um, I think this, like I was thinking about like, um, yeah, I mean, our foods are not fancy, but like the, it, it, they're really examples of survival. And I think about like, we have this, um, when I was growing up, women, if you had a child, you, had, you gave birth to a child, you had to eat boiled chicken for 30 days. And women here were like, oh, such a punishment, oh my gosh, you know? And even though I'm a feminist, like the first time my friend who's the same age as me, she had, she ate a p slice of pizza the first night she gave birth. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> uh, that's how ingrained it was in me. But, you know, but then if you think about historically, it was a privilege because in Laos, people didn't get protein. So the, the pregnant woman, the, the new mom got to have boiled chicken so that she could heal, right? Um, I think about, um, uh, you know, one of my favorite dishes is this dish called um, gai tso, or gai cho, as Hmong people call it. It's not pretty. It's basically you take a bunch of pieces of pork, like the head, the gelatinous parts, like some, that you boil it all down and it becomes really gooey and like, uh, like almost becomes like um, shredded pork and you add ginger to it, mm -hmm. that is actually my comfort food. Yum. And so, like, um, I, I, could, I can make it in Instant Pot. It's not as good as the real stuff. <laughs> but but the, the thing is that, it, but this is an example of uh, food that people made for survival, right? You take everything and you don't throw away stuff and you make something delicious out of it. Yeah. So, Yan, do you want to respond to this question at all before we move on to the next question? Um, can you repeat the question? I don't even know how we started. Um, <laughs> it was about absence. Yeah. But, so one of the things that always moves me when you talk about being a child and coming as mm -hmm. an adoptee and that you missed Korean food, like you missed kimchi. And, and it's so amazing how these, uh, these flavors are so in our DNA or part of our um, emotional or, or just bake up, you know, like the, how, how we grow up. Um, and so this idea of absence, um, making you realize how important something is. Yeah, definitely. And just how, um, I mean, how what your gestating parent eats while you're in the gestating room, <laughs> um, the womb. Um, <laughs> but I just had to call it gestating room. You know, um, affects your sense of taste and then, yeah, what you're fed early on. And when I came, um, so my mom, my adopted mom would buy me kimchi, but my dad and my brother would complain about it. And so it was, you know, it was like the, um, kind of the, like the immigrant kid in the caf cafeteria, except it was like in my house. And I would do things just like, I didn't have any, I didn't consult with anyone about this. I didn't talk about it. I just instinctively like I started eating ramen for breakfast in grade school like no one else in my house was eating ram like salty things but I've never I've always just liked salty things for breakfast I would do things like drink pickle juice because <laughs> I my body was just like I need the pickling <laughs> I you know uh, I would um, like chop up a whole onion saute it and like eat that for like that would be like a snack like I don't, you know, like there was no internet. Like I just, my body was like, well, you, you want to eat this. You want to drink this pickle juice, you know? Cause I was, if I wasn't having kimchi every day. It was kind of more like a special thing that my mom would get on occasion, but on a weekly basis, it was like, oh, but I need this. So to me, it's just, that's really powerful that even in isolation, even as a kid, even if you don't have encouragement, like your body is going to, um, crave the things that it grew up with or that um, it had, at, you know, in, while you were gestating, that continuity, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the questions I, I came up with actually today was I was rereading some of your pieces was um, a question about um, kind of learned knowledge or this kind of like, um, uh, I would say maybe, I don't want to say feminine wisdom, but um, since St. Kate's is a women's college and we're co-hosting, I feel it's important for me to ask a question about like 
the value of this different type of education, right? My mom had a second grade education. Um, you know, she's smart, but, but she can cook like you could not believe. And there's so much talent and so much uh, genius in, in the knowledge that she actually has. And so when I was reading a lot of your stories, I was thinking about how that kind of knowledge um, is, is learned through our matrilineage, um, kind of, you know, in the ways in which we can um, decenter kind of this idea of what be, um, intelligence or, or um, knowledge is. Does that make sense? Um, so can you speak to how you would think about the ways in which you learn, what, learn how to cook, but then how that translates into your appreciation of different types of knowledge? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just thinking about like when I first started cooking <laughs> at home, like um, here, um, after I left um, New York, I remember spending so much time trying to like, okay, I got to get the, the proper measurements and I got to, and it was this sort of like this kind of idea of like, I didn't trust what I thought I knew or, and I was like, no, I need to really have like the exact, because then I'll know the exact measurements and then I could write that down and then I could know it. And, and my mother had a way of just sort of like putting her hand in the bag of rice and knowing exactly how much. And I'm like, how do you know from your hand how much is going to feed the family? Mm -hmm. And even if you do this for years, but how do you know what a cup is? Like, how does that feel? I don't know what a cup feels like. Um, but <laughs> she always knew, OK, there's four of us. I know what the cup feels like. I, and it was always enough. Um, but as I, I've gotten older, and the more that I cook, the more I sort of I, I let go of those ideas because I always made mistakes when I was using like I had to have a cup of this and a and a teaspoon of that. It always turned out crazy. Like it, it never tasted right. It never made any sense. And I was like, how does this work? And my mother would come visit and she's like, what are you doing? What is this? <laughs> what do you have all these pieces, all these utensils, all these things to make this thing that's not that hard to make? She's like, you do this and then you do that and then you put some of this on it and then you figure that out and then you look at the time and then you put it in the oven. But then you put the and I was like. Oh, okay, I need to trust. It was just more about trusting. And, and now I can sort of do it with my eyes closed. Like, it's like, okay, I need to just trust what I, what I think I know, but then I don't believe that I actually know it because I never actually learned it. And so I, di I didn't believe in the learning that I was picking up. Because again, when my mother was cooking, I mean, where was I? I was there. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't anywhere else. I, I wasn't allowed to watch TV or be in the other room or whatever. I had to be right there holding the, you know, the whatever, strainer, doing this, giving her this pot, whether I was miserable or angry about it or reading the Sweet Valley High book, whatever it could be. <laughs> but I was still in that place picking it all up and not realizing that I was actually learning that. I, was, I thought I was being disgruntled and, and angry. Um, I was like, I'm just an angry teenager. I'm an American. I'm doing this other mm -hmm. thing. And she was like, you're learning. It's fine. You're here. It's enough. And I, I knew it. I knew it more than I realized. <laughs> I, knew it. I knew it better than the things that I actually went to school to learn. See? Mm -hmm. Didn't know. Well, so my mom, when I was a teenager, she would say things like, you know, uh, my sister, we had sisters in law that lived with us. So she'd be like, go to the kitchen. So I would go to the kitchen and then I hung out and I talked to my sister-in-law and of course years later she was like, how come you don't know how to cook? I told you to go to the kitchen and I'm like, you didn't say learn how to cook. <laughs> right? She was like, I hung out and I talked and my sister-in-law didn't make me do anything. Um, turned out that her method actually worked for my younger sisters because they're really great cooks and I'm like, how'd you learn? When, when did you learn how to make those? I never saw mom making this. They're like, uh, I was in the kitchen. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, but I, so my relationship with cooking is interesting. So I mean, it, so I'm a mediocre mom cook. All too, so when I say that, people are like, oh, you don't know how to cut, you make stuff. I'm like, no, if I'm a mediocre mom cook, it means I'm a pretty decent American cook, okay? You know? <laughs> uh, so, but the thing is, I think that I was really rebellious because I grew up during a time period where Hmong women and girls were expected to be in the kitchen to cook and clean and so, so that you could be a better housewife material and I was just like, forget that. And so I, I rebelled. So when I was the oldest daughter in the house, I didn't cook. I ordered fast food for my siblings, you know, uh, and we were fine. And so I think my relationship to, even to this day, actually most of my siblings are really good cooks, chefs. I mean, I have a brother who's a chef, like a sister who's, you know, they do some of this stuff professionally sometimes. Anyway, they're, they're really good cooks. Uh, and I'm not, but I, I'm the story keeper. Mm -hmm. I learned, I remember 
the first time we had relatives that came over when I would, this is like 1987, people coming over to make um, yuwa, you know, mung rice patties, and learning the story of how yuwa was like sort of um, a, a collective effort by, you know, relatives, you know. So, so anyway, I remember the stories behind food. Um, not so good at making it, uh, but I don't think that's my place. Yeah, doesn't have to be. Yeah. That's so interesting. It, it, I just, I, I totally identify with that because, yeah, so much of that rebellion for me was sort of like, I'm not going to be a wife. Yeah. I'm not going to... I don't care. Like, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. And my mother would be like, well, you're going to feed yourself. And I'm like, I'll figure it out. It's fine. I'm not going to do this. Mm -hmm. But stories. Yeah. I can remember dates. I can remember mm -hmm. all kinds of things. This happened this time. They're like, this, did, this, happen this is when this happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I could tell you all those stories. But food, my sister's better at it than I. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that question so much. <laughs> because the idea of like alternate knowledges is so essential to building self-esteem as a, a child of refugees, as refugees, um, in a society where we're often so undervalued and it's hard for people to even know how to value us. <laughs> like, thankfully there's programs now like the West Gateway program where they try to like match your credentials based on what they think you got back in your homeland, mm -hmm. which didn't exist when my parents came here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so much of our lives were just kind of um, not believing the world that made us feel like our parents weren't smart and that our mothers specifically because you know um I, I i'm not sure if everybody's like this but for us uh the cultural uh what is this word the person who kind of passes on cultural knowledge is usually the woman in the in the afghan families the man is more expected to be outside earning money has to assimilate within the culture that you're inside mm -hmm. Uh, but a woman usually is inside, so she's the one who passed on cultural knowledge. And my mother learned English later than my father. My mother um, actually had more schooling in Afghanistan than my father because he had to leave earlier because they were um, kind of like kidnapping boys and putting them in the army, the US-backed Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. Um, so he left earlier. But my mother, who had a little bit more education than him, still, when she came to this country, she was a lot less prepared. My father learned English because he got here earlier, these kinds of things. And so it was really tough to see how kind of um, my mother was just stuck in this specific role of cooking and cleaning and hosting. Um, and I love that you're talking about how food knowledge and the ability to cook and the ability to do these homemaking tasks, it is really a really important skill and an important uh, knowledge and I did grow up believing that my mother was and I still believe the most intelligent person I knew growing up and still to this day and now like she went to school she learned English she has a degree um, she has like this really nice job that she does from home and she speaks in her like she talks to Americans all the time on the phone <laughs> and, um, I mean yeah I think my mother seeing her and just believing in um, who she is as a person and the intelligence she has, regardless of how the world reacted to her, was so essential. And yeah, I think food did play a huge part in that. So I really appreciate that question. That's great. Um, so young. Um, gosh. I'll, I'll, one of the things I'll say is that um, on my first trip back to South Korea, we stayed in, and I went with other Korean adoptees, and then we went with like a Korean family. So we didn't bring our um, adoptive families with us. Uh, and so going living with the host family, and this is 1987, it was the year before the 88 Olympics, and um, there was political unrest, uh, pro-democracy pro actions, also um, protesting the government that was like, cleaning up poverty around the Olympic Village and trying to, you know, buff their image for um, international consumption as and, and what was criticized for exporting, you know, 200,000 children, um, even though it was trying to be this quote unquote first world nation hosting the Olympics. Um, but with food, so one of the, one of the most the vivid memories from that visit, the host family visit, is that the mother made all the food for the family and for us, the guests, and then ate in the kitchen. It didn't come out at all. Um, 
I was used to my American mother doing all of that and not sitting down the entire meal and then not eating, like had been kind of eating while she was cooking and, and not sitting at all. So it wasn't all that different from my um, gendered role that I grew up with. But to be completely out of sight, to me, um, yeah, just left a big impression with me. So my whole experience of cooking growing up, whether uh, at home or in South Korea, was very much gender divided. And so, yes, I've always felt like cooking is really political for women. And there's really, um, I really wanted to make choices around how much domesticity I wanted to have in my life and how much I wanted to spend outside of the home or pursuing other things. And it's, you know, always a, always kind of a struggle. Um, I think it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that um, struck me about your story, May, mm -hmm. was, um, I, and I don't know if you, oops, sorry, if you've read May's story, but um, it's about a, a funeral, correct? And um, I just love it when there is a moment where one of your relatives says to you, do you guys want to do something? And you're like, no, no, we're good. We're just going to oh, yeah. stay out of it. Um, and it, and that moment kind of resonated with me because I was thinking about later you, in the essay, you come back to like, well, how do these people know how to do these mm -hmm. rituals, right? Yeah. And that if you, if everyone were like, okay, we're good, who would know how to do it con to continue these rituals, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, it's really fascinating when we bring it back to kind of care and community care is that these, these rituals, our cultures, our traditions, our identities, um, they take care, mm -hmm. right? We, somebody has to keep them up, right? And I think you mentioned that in your essay too, Zash. Um, so what do you guys think about this idea of like, how much do you hold on and how much do you adapt? And then who, who are the ones to continue this care, you know? And how important is it? Like, yeah. like is it gonna, I mean, well, it, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, for context, I wrote a, my essay is called Living with the Dead. And so my dad is already dead for several years by the time this moment happens. And so basically my uncle called and said that, um, my dad's spirit contacted his wife because his wife is a sh shaman and was restless and we needed to do a ceremony to help him out on his other side so we did a ceremony but um the thing is that even even be before that moment like every single year sort of around father's day or mother's day or before their birthdays um i do uh i i i, I and my family members uh go to their gravestones and leave them food Right, and there is a ritual because now every single year now there's more people. So first year was whatever a meal, and then now several meals. So anyway, so we leave food for the dead, and then you always bring an extra dish for a wandering ghost. And so oh, I always, if you ever go to the cemetery, especially Oakland. By the way, if you need food, I'm like, I guess you can go steal food off the dead. <laughs> go look, go look for Mon gravestones. They're usually dark and like the the black one. It's very easy to find. <laughs> Uh, look at birth. I'm gonna write. I'm writing a story about this. Okay. Oh, somebody okay. yeah. memorize the dates that people have died, so they can kind of go and check out when there's food. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the thing is that you leave food, an extra serving for ghosts that won't have food, and you tell them specifically, eat this stuff. Don't touch my family's food. You know, I even leave a bouquet of flowers for them by the side of the, you know whatever. But you know, um, I it, you know my family members just kind of told me haphazardly like this is what you do. But I mean, what's interesting is I'm, I'm actually taking a class right now. Uh, there's a young shaman, he's only 24 years old, but he's been practicing for 12 years. And his, he, he's teaching Hmong women about these spiritual beliefs with the intention of making us more aware about these processes so that we can, I mean, that's his form of fighting against the patriarchy. Because um, he had told us about how his, when some, it, his mother was sick uh, and they didn't, cause he didn't, his dad wasn't in the picture uh a lot of the shamans didn't want to help him so he was like this is bs so anyway so he, anyway so i'm learning and i'm actually learning about rituals why we do stuff uh what do we do and what's really fascinating about that course is even he's like these are some things that you can do on your own you don't have to be a shaman but these are just some practices that monk people do but because as you 
I mentioned earlier, a lot of the, when I was growing up, a lot of the rules were just like what my mom said, you know, go to the kitchen, but they expect you to learn stuff, but they don't tell you things. And so now as an adult, I'm going back through the process of learning things. And I'm, because I'm a writer and a storyteller, I tell these things to younger people who find it fascinating. I mean, my best audiences are my nieces and nephews who are between the ages of two and eight. They know Aww. so much about um, Hmong vampires. <laughs> 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 Not kidding, it is a thing. Uh, and, and we have conversations about the soul and these grandparents that they've never met and what does it mean to, uh, and what Hmong life was like. In, anyway, so keep the stories alive for me anyway. Do you, does anybody want to follow up? Or I have another random question that I would like to follow up with if nobody. I mean, I could say a little bit. Yeah. I feel like this question of uh, change and holding on to what you grew up with or what you knew as, as signifiers of care or cultural signifiers is so hard to cope with. Um, it puts so much pressure on younger generations that often are so, uh, don't have access to knowledge to continue on with things that they, they literally can't. And then it like builds up guilt and shame and you know, change is just natural. So I feel like the, the process of like knowing what to keep and what to let go, it just almost happens naturally. And like we keep what works for us, what makes us feel great, we kind of change what, what maybe uh, triggers some of those shame or uh, outdated feelings or you're saying that uh, gender Thing about mm -hmm. fighting patriarchy by not cooking yeah. potentially and these kinds of things like yeah that's a totally natural change and and you know nobody's knowledge of a specific place is the same as another person's ever no matter if you grew up in the same neighborhood on the same street no matter what you will always have a different experience of it, of it. so everybody's coming at this with different knowledge I can meet an Afghan and I'll have a completely different idea of something than they do like even w something is like uh, you think it's so uh, as uh, standardizes like a wedding practice or a funeral uh, mm -hmm. practices, still there will be little yeah. changes. So it's like what it means to be Avian, what it means to be a woman, what it means to care for each other it has so many different definitions. But I feel like it just naturally happens and so much pressure is so unnecessary on ourselves. But I do see, feel like we do obviously need to keep up the care. We do need to keep up these practices. And, and, and then part of it is, too, is um, honoring our ancestors or mm -hmm. honoring the legacy that in which we are part of or um, a history that we're part of, right? And so, um, and it can be so complicated, history is so complicated. Um, but, but I think it's something that is it's not a, a question that is, is ever answered. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I think it's a, a, an ever-evolving question, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, so we only have a little bit of time before the Q&A, so I have this really random question. So, if, if, so in Vietnamese tradition, um, we believe in the afterlife, and so like with the Hmong, we, put an, we have an altar and we put food on the altar for our loved ones. Um, and so what would you want on your altar if I were to honor you um, after you pass? And I will say that if you love me, you'll put fried chicken. <laughs> fried chicken. Yeah, some pho or something and a Coke. That then I would like love you forever. Oh my god. And I won't care that if I'm fat in the afterlife, right? Okay. <laughs> That's a funny question. I think about that, and I think about how I think in Haitian traditions. Um, the there's you know the spirits and the, there's they're still connected to to the physical realm and they want to enjoy physical things and so people leave cigarettes and rum and things mm -hmm. like the 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 vices the things that people yeah. really yeah. really enjoy and so I'm like thinking like the things that I would I definitely would want some rum mm -hmm. I would want I would want mangoes but mm -hmm. they have to be perfectly right. Right. Yes, and they have to be from the place where they like. Oh. They can't. They can't have traveled. Like they have to come oh. off the tree, right? Like wow. because they just smell different. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's a specific. Here, yeah, it's, it's a specific <laughs> thing. Like it's just like they smell a different way, and it just and it it's so upsetting <laughs> when I pick up a mango. I'm like, this doesn't smell right. And like, Argh. it's like so it has to smell right. And yeah, def definitely mangoes. A lot of them. 
I would, yes, I want uh, all over my face. Yeah, I would deal with that. Yeah. Um, I would say, I mean, traditionally, Koreans pour soju on the graves of their departed. Um, so I guess a bottle of soju and then like a Korean English dictionary so that I can complete my language lessons in the afterlife, <laughs> like just talk to my ancestors. Um, I was also going to say to, to, in your last question, just really quick, like I'm the only one on today's esteemed panel with, with children. My older one just turned 25 on Saturday. My younger one is 21 and I took them to Korea in 2018. And, but basically like if I want them to do anything, I have to just play mind games and pretend like I don't really want them to do that. And then eventually they'll have the idea but think that it's their own idea. So in terms of cultural you know, transmission, it's really, um, yeah, I have to kind of just go at it sideways because if I tell them like, oh, you're supposed to do this, you, you need to like learn Korean, you need to, like one child, like my older child can use chopsticks, blah, blah, blah. My younger child like refuses to try to learn to use chopsticks, stuff like that. Like if I pressure them, they'll just rebel. Um, so it has to be, yeah, just it's a lot of reverse psychology <laughs> with the children and okay, yeah. You don't, you don't have anything to eat on your on your altar, you've really yeah. got soju and a dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, white like rice and a rice cooker. That's like, yeah. Okay. Rice, rice cooker, chili paste, kimchi. That's okay. it. Yeah. Okay, what about me, Uh I would want a bowl of water, uh, oh, rice and water, and then a plate of like salty. The pork with ginger? Pork chop. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, not. Wait, well, either one. But, Okay, I, I, I'll be honest. I've said I, I think I want my last meal to be a salty pork chop, fried, fried pork chop. Mm. I suppose since we're being decadent, a slice of cake from um, Cafe, Cafe Latte. Latte. <laughs> <laughs> the turtle cake or? Yeah, the turtle chocolate cake. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what about you, Zalash? It's so hard. Uh, I don't know, because I think I would just want anything cooked by my mother. Mm. Aww. Yeah. But she might not be. Um, I know for me. I know. <laughs> so you gotta. What can I cook for you on your own? Oh. <laughs> Let's think. Okay, I would want uh, fidni, okay. which is a pudding um, that's flavored with rose water and cardamom. Oh yum! It's Ooh. so good. Is it like it's a rice so pudding? It's so easy to make. No, it's a milk pudding. Mm. No, yeah, it's a milk pudding and it's thickened with cornstarch and it's really easy to make. It's just a lot of stirring. And it's so delicious. I love stirring. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, can you get it in the Twin Cities anywhere? No. Not at a restaurant anywhere? Oh, actually, maybe at Khyber Pass. Oh. They're the only place I know that, yeah, does Afghan stuff, actually Afghan, Afghan. Yeah, nice. in tiny portions, but it's still there. Okay. <laughs> All right, Alexander, do we have any questions from the audience that you'd like me to? Or at this point, do people want to just... Raise your hand, possibly. Yeah, if you, you know what, let's just take Okay, we've got a beautiful, beautiful audience here. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question for any of the panelists or all the panelists? Oh, yeah. I'm glad I have to read it myself because my handwriting is horrible, so I wrote it twice. <laughs> um, cooking and sharing your ancestral foods are intimate acts. What similarities do they share with writing as an act of confession? Ooh, that's a really good, I'm going to take that question from you. <laughs> She's brilliant. She is brilliant. Act of confession, did you say? Yeah. Could we hear that question one more time? It's just so good. Here, look, can I, do you think, can I read it so the mic yeah. picks it up? If you can read it, I dare you. <laughs> Although you read, you know your sister's handwriting. Yeah. <laughs> um, could I read the Yeah. Okay. What is the cooking? Okay. <laughs> okay, bear with me, people. Okay, cooking and sharing your ancestral foods are intimate acts. Mm. What similarities does it share with writing as an act of confession? Wow, that's deep. You're deep. 
I think I'm getting hung up on the word confession. Hmm. It's low. It's a loaded word. It is. I always hear that writers they always uh if they have a balance and act between what they want to share and what they want to hide. And mm. That's always something they try to work toward in their art. So, you know, and cooking is just so intimate as writing is. So I wonder how you guys would find similarities between the two. I mean, I, 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 I'm near TMI, you know, so like, I, so I, I, yeah, I have a show called 10 Reasons Why I'd Be a Bad Porn Star, so I'm like, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, I, so, so I think that in, and I never was one, by the way, <laughs> but, um, but, but the, I do think both are very intimate acts, but, I, but when I think about that, I think about like, um, I, when I'm writing a story, and I'm thinking about like, when I was starting as a writer, I, often, I was taught to write for the white gaze, right? And I could never be authentically myself, whatever that meant. The older I've gotten, the more I realized that the, kind, the good kind of stories, the, I, the, the good stories that I and other people want to need and need, need to read are actually the ones that are intimate, that are, are not really um, curated for a certain audience. And so now, uh, similar to like, if you come to my house, I'm not gonna give you sweet and sour chicken from Panda Express. I'll give you the real food, and you have to deal with it. And so I think of that same way for my stories now. It's like, this is the authentic stuff, and deal with it, even if you don't understand everything, or it's not your taste. But the good thing is that you're, you're getting the real deal. So. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's doing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, I think I'll say that uh, yeah, they both do involve vulnerability because I think the like at their best they're both about um, hospitality and care and the other person or the other persons. Like when I'm writing, I want to provide a hospitable but also interesting experience for the reader, and then if I'm cooking, I I put a lot of pressure on myself to, like I really want it to be good for the other people. I want them to um, feel really, like for it to be really easy to eat and like for everything to be this, the right temperature at the right time and like, you know. Um, so I think that sense of, um, yeah, trying to support the other person, whether it's the reader or the eater, does feel really similar. So mm -hmm. thanks for that question. Sweet question. I'm thinking about value again, mm -hmm. and thinking about how food and writing both, um, how value plays into it in terms of as refugees and immigrants, when we cook, how our food is valued when we host people, how that act is valued in a culture that doesn't have a hosting culture. Um, and writing, uh, often when we write from like really traumatic and tragic experiences associated with our identities, um, whether that's valued or not, or whether we're getting caricatured. So like I'm thinking about specifically like when I was, so I, in Af Afghanistan, you <laughs> are friends with somebody or like you develop a relationship as, especially as women, by saying, come to my house, I'll cook for you, come eat at my house. And I did this as a college student. <laughs> I would be like, hi, yeah, you should come over sometime. <laughs> and then I would cook. And then I would lay out the, this, the tablecloth and I would give them food and everything. And in Afghanistan, you were, the person who came and ate your food, that's a big deal, and then they reciprocate. So a person never comes to your house twice. They, you have to oh. go to their house next. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen with Americans. Americans did not get it back. They were like, thanks, bye. <laughs> it was just, so, and like another thing we do is like, we offer you food mm -hmm. three times, even if we don't necessarily have enough for ourselves or to share, we still offer as a polite act. And you're supposed to say no the first time and the second time. But the third time, you're allowed to say yes if you actually want it. And the, <laughs> you're allowed to say yes. If the person asks three times, that means you're actually being offered food. Not before then. But Americans hear it once and they're like, yes. <laughs> and so my mom would just be like, you need to stop. You're wearing yourself out. It's not normal for them. Stop cooking. Stop giving people your food. And I think, <laughs> like literally, it was a problem. I would like cry to her 
and be like, no one's my friend, no one invites me over. <laughs> and so um, I'm thinking about writing and how it's similar it is in terms of how we devalue, especially women of color. Like we expect women of, so much of women of color, we expect them to fit into these ridiculous MFA programs that don't care about us. <laughs> we try to like fit into like the lyric eye mode and, and try to be ourselves within these like understandings of writing that have nothing to do with our histories. And we get paid so little to do what we do. Like you can get, apply for a writing contest that has a $25 prize. You know, it's just so hard when you're, especially as a starting writer, to value yourself enough to be like, no, I'm not gonna apply for everything. I'm not gonna just show up to everything. And I feel like, so, I guess that's what a really important part of writing and thing that writing and cooking has in common for me is learning that important lesson of who I'm gonna share my really valuable, exactly. like intimate, like my cooking is something that I don't know anybody else who can do it the way I do. Mm -hmm. And I know that because of my mom and my grandma. Nobody can do it the way I do, and I'm not going to share that with everybody I meet anymore. Same with my writing. I'm not going to share that with everybody I meet anymore. I'm not going to be like, oh, you give me a compliment. Here. You know, like, oh, you like my writing. Here, publish this for free. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's something I think they have in common. Very good. Good answer. Okay, Valerie, you get the, the last um, word. Writing and cooking. I, I was thinking about this while everybody else was speaking, and I was thinking how I don't share my cooking. Mm -hmm. I really, I really do not. I do not. I cook at home for me and my husband, and I don't, I do not share it. And it just feels very, and I, just the thought of it terrifies me. I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, it's mine, and I don't want to share it. I, I don't, it's, it's, it's this weird sort of like, whereas I feel differently about my writing. I used to feel that way about my writing, I guess, when I first started writing when I was younger, but I feel a little bit more. I guess detached in a way where I can share it and if you like it cool and if you don't you don't whatever and it doesn't it's it doesn't bother me whereas my cooking is is so intimate it just feels too it's too tender to share <laughs> like I saw an article in the New York Times about like pickles something that Haitian people put on like um, on griot and stuff and I was horrified. I was like, how dare you? How dare you put something of mine? <laughs> you put my secrets out on the street this way. I was, it just, it just overwhelmed me. And then there was, and then we're, I went into like Haitian Twitter and we're all talking about it. And everybody's just like, can you believe it? They told everybody about Pinkley's. This isn't ours. And I was like, no, I can't, I just can't stand it. It just, I was, I, I was very upset. <laughs> and so it's it, something about, I don't know. Something about it, does, it, and it doesn't, it's not like shame or anything, it's just like, but it's mine, and it's my secret, and I like it, and I don't see why I have to share it with anybody. I mean, you can go look it up if you want, but I'm not going to tell you about it. Like, it, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's on YouTube, you know, but no, it's mine. <laughs> it's, yeah. Seriously, I'm not even, it's not, I'm not even hyperbole. No. <laughs> But these bun me are staring at me over here. And I think we have books to give away, Alexandra. So we have, uh, did people put in their names for the book? Um, no, they're just, there are three books in the bag, and first come, first Okay. So um, I would uh, and ask you please to give our panelists a really wonderful round of applause. <laughs> have a very delicious conversation and I think I think we absolutely did um, and thank you all so much for braving COVID and coming out and supporting Read Brave supporting the public library thank you Maureen and everyone especially to Alexandra who is the most amazing pro program coordinator um, for supporting my work with the library and um, please Look at the recipes, they're there for you to take home. There's their recipes online, and there's still little time if you'd like to submit a recipe. So, thank you so much, everyone. Wait, 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 we need a